The Pearl of the Soul of the World by Meredith Ann Pierce, Chapter 6, Blackbird. Ariel arose and wandered through the close, the close staked pavilion, encountering no one. Those who glimpsed her in the distance gave her a wide berth. All seemed in awe of her. She sighed, lonely, suddenly for someone who did not know her, someone who would not recognize her instantly and draw away. She was sorry now to have let Aaron leave her, and was just turning to find her way out of the jumble of tent backs and supply pavilions that surrounded her when a snatch of conversation reached her ear. She paused, frowning, seeing no one else about. A great green silk tent loomed before her, billowing in the light desert breeze. She felt that she felt the air's coolness against her cheek and the touch of the sandy grit it bore. The slapping of the open tent flap only deepened the stillness. Puzzled, she found herself listening, straining, but for long moments she heard only wind and silk. Then it came again, a low muffle of voices. One of them, unmistakably, Ira laughs. If you, pois if you positioned your horse troops like so, my mother's bow women could be stationed here. Ariel froze, hearing the faint rasp of metal against metal, another spoke. Then our foot could be divided here and here, Saber's voice. She recognized it now, imagined the bandit queen unsheathing and pointing with her dagger, the rasp of metal against the dagger sheathed. You never did tell me what happened to that fine Bernian blade I once gave you. The teasing tone had stolen into Saber's voice. Ariel blinked. Banter from the bandit queen was rare. A rattling of parchment. I broke it, came Miralath's short reply. Their voices did not come from within, Ariel realized suddenly, drawing near the dark pavilion. Its back stood behind the backs of a rose and a saffron tent cutting off a kind of courtyard from the open space around. How, pray, the prince's cousin was asking, the blade was burning in steel. Ariel stood very very still beside the green pavilion, listening, silence from Irolath. Cautiously, she peered around the green silk edge. Saber and Irolath stood in the courtyard beyond. They were alone without the usual swarm of aides and attendants. Half turned from his cousin, the prince of Averick broke over a... broke... The Prince of Averick bent over a scroll. Saber toyed with her own burnium blade. I'll give you answer, she told him softly. Don't, he said abruptly, straightening and rolling the parchment up. He moved away from Saber, but only a step. She followed and boldly laid one, laid one hand, just so, across the scars that threaded his cheek. Astonishment gripped Ariel. She clenched her teeth to keep from crying out. She expected Irolath to pull instantly away from Saber, but instead he turned slowly as if unwilling to look at her. Can't you love me, cousin? She asked him. Even a little. Ariel felt a surge of outrage, then blinding jealousy. Irolath would never have permitted her such a touch. She bit her tongue, half hoping she would strike Saber, push her roughly aside, revile, half hoping he would strike Saber, push her roughly aside, revile her, but he only shook his head and the look in his eyes was a desperate sadness, not anger. I can love no woman while the witch's enchantment is on me, he answered. I have told you that. He had told her? Incomprehension filled Ariel, her fingers on the pole beneath the pavilion. Beneath the pavilion, silk tightened. She had thought only she and perhaps the Lady Silva privy to that secret. All Aaron and the camp could know were rumors. Yet he had told Saber why. She, who many still called the Queen of Averick, dropped her hand from him, her face falling. Yes, she said quietly, and the only satisfaction it gives me is that you cannot love her either. Don't speak of her so, whispered Ira laugh. Saber turned abruptly away. She frightens you, doesn't she? The prince's cousin snapped. Almost as much as the witch. You fear her sorceress green eyes see everything, Saber snorted. Do they? Do they see us now? Only half hidden in the corner of the tent, Ariel stood riveted, too stunned to move. She felt powerless, exposed, standing in plain view, yet neither her husband nor the so-called Queen of Averick took note of her, their eyes on one another. She stood in the Temple of Fire at Orm, continued Saber bitterly. It has burned her shadow away. She wears a pearl on her breast that is full of light. What sort of mortal creature is that? The bandit queen turned back to Irolath, seizing his arm. This time, he did not move away. I tell you, she is no mortal woman. She is some unworldly thing, revenge sorceress. 
How could you love her? Surely the witch's spell is simply what you have told her to keep at bay. The prince shook his head. His voice was hoarse. Would that it were. His cousin did not seem to be listening. Her knuckles were pale, where she clenched his arm. But I am a mortal woman. I would be content with just your heart, truly. At last, at last, he pulled free of her. Watching, Ariel held her breath. Her knees felt shaky, weak. She clung to the pavilion pole. I am not free to give it, said Irolath. My heart is not my own. She took it, didn't she? Saber snapped. The prince bowed his head, looking away from her. He touched his breast and gilded it with lead. I was speaking of the witch, the bandit queen replied. When she rescued you and took the witch's gilding off, she didn't give you back your own heart, did she? She kept that for herself, Saber strode around to face him and laid her hand upon his breast. The heart that beats here is not yours, is it? She pressed. He would not look at her. How then can you say, Saber insisted lowly, that she did not seek to make you hers exactly as did the witch? Ariel felt rage surge in her again, dangerously. Not true, not true. She had only wanted to save him by putting her own living heart in his breast. It had been Tal, the mage, who had taken the enchanted Dark Angel's heart, purged it of the witch's lead, and placed it onto the dying Ariel's breast. I love you, said Saber. Don't say it. The prince's voice was ragged. Saber's hand remained upon his heart. She answered, I don't care whether you can lie with me or not. I only want you to love me in return. He looked up, then hard away. Ariel saw the despair in his eyes. I can't, he whispered to Saber. I don't know how. The witch has got her talons in me still. I can't love you or her or anyone while the white witch lives. The sky seemed to spin over Ariel. There, he had used it. Saber's word, that nameless her. Saber reached the cup to the prince's face in her hands, but Ariel hardly saw. I'll show you, she told him. I'll help you. Again, he shook her. Again, he shook his head. Jealousy consumed Ariel. How dared the bandit queen? How could Saber, who had known Irolath only a few short day months, become so close to him? Surely she, Ariel, had tried every whit as hard to touch him, to lend comfort, to know his heart, only to be repeatedly rebuffed. You cannot help me, he had once told her by starlight. No one can help me. But she did not hear him say so to Saber now. Whether you love me or not, she told him, whether you can lie with me or not, I love you. And I only wish that your heart were your own to give as you choose, not some scrap to be tugged to pieces between the teeth of the white witch and the green eyed sor and a green eyed sorceress. Ah, cousin, Irolath told her, if only that were so, and we will pause there.